Hello everybody, it's Kara from Wild Book Garden and today I'm here with part one of my March wrap-up. So I read a ton of books in March again, actually almost many as I almost as many as I read in February, um, but for some reason today it feels like less stressful to do more books in fewer parts, even though normally that's not the case. So I'm gonna try and just do this in two parts. We'll see how that goes. Um, but the first book that I finished in March was The Stepsister and the Slipper by Nina Clare. Um, this is a book in the, Phil the Villains Ever After series, um, which are by a bunch of different authors, and they all tend to be pretty short, like novellas. Um, and the thing linking them together is that each of them is like a fairy tale villain who gets a romance. And I had picked up a few of these, like the ones that interested me. This is the first one that I read, even though it's kind of, I think it's in the middle of the series. Um, but we're following the one of the wicked stepsisters from Cinderella and maybe she's not so wicked after all maybe she's just very determined and uh, charming and good at what she does um, and so the book is about her trying to basically her trying to um, win over the prince in order to like take care of her family and like their financial situation and everything and I just really really loved this like I expected to enjoy it but I was really just like really impressed I think at how much like characterization and like story and like interesting developments happened in such a short book. I really loved our main character Lady Charlotte like she just like she's definitely selfish in some ways but in others she's not and she definitely grows and she's definitely like a very complex character um like she can be kind of like petty or selfish but um she can also be very caring um, and I really enjoyed her. I also really loved the romance in this book. Um, like I just think the way those characters played off of each other, it just was so entertaining and like they were just so well matched. Um, I also, you know, there were a couple of moments that were personal favorite tropes of mine. Like there's a very brief scene where they have to pretend to be married that I enjoyed. Um, and also there's like a little hint of one of my other favorite romance tropes, which is like trying to like one character is supposedly like going to help the other one with their love life and it turns out that they end up liking them instead um so i enjoyed that as well i also really loved how confident in herself charlotte was um like she in some ways she's not like the typical like what's considered fashionable at the time like in terms of beauty standards like she's very tall um and things like that but she like works that you know and she really loves that and she does have some believable insecurities um but most of the time she's a very confident uh, female character and that was really cool um i also thought blanche was interesting and where her storyline went i liked that like i really just loved this the only thing that kept this from being five stars is that after loving the rest of the story so much, I feel like I wanted a little more from the ending, um, like from the resolution, but I did love this and I gave The Stepsister and The Slipper 4.5 stars. Next, I have a couple of arcs that I read. And the first one is Kaikei by Vaishnavi Patel, which comes out on April 26th. Um, and this is a retelling, like a reimagining of one of the queens um, named Kakei from the Ramayana, um, which is a really important Hindu epic. So of course we are following Kakei as our main character. This kind of reimagines um, like a, a backstory for her and kind of gives different motivations, different context for some of the events that happen in the Ramayana, which I do know a little bit about, but I'm not like super knowledgeable about it. And this was a really interesting reading experience. Um, this has gotten like glowing reviews so far. My feelings on it are kind of mixed. The first quarter of this book was really really slow. Like it took me like quite a while to get into it, like to get invested. Um, I do appreciate that the writing wasn't super overdone and like really bogging you down because that's something I've noticed with certain kinds of um, certain kinds of character focused stories is that there's a particular kind of writing that we can sometimes get with them which is like basically overloading the story in a way that kind of covers up like plot and character stuff and so this book didn't do that which I really appreciated um but yeah I just wasn't super invested in like the first quarter of this then the second quarter I loved like we really started getting to know Kakei more um this is the point when she ends up getting married off to somebody and um at this point in the story she actually starts like making friends and allies with the other wives which I loved I really loved their friendship and their like bond um, I also really liked Kakei's like determination. We see her start to use her position of power um, to help women in her kingdom and I really loved that. But then like the whole second half of the book I was not a big fan of um, and there were quite a few reasons for that. One thing that made me really uncomfortable throughout the book and I kept thinking that this was going to be addressed and I feel like it kind of never was um, is the portrayal of Hinduism in the book and like I am not Hindu myself so I can't like speak definitively to that representation. It just struck me as being like it was really vilified um like hindu people were kind of written about as like being inherently like backwards or like uninformed and the author actually released like a 
kind of like a review or like a statement or like talking about kind of her feelings for this book and why she wanted to write this book. Um, and it is an own voices story and I, I really appreciated um, like getting to read why she wrote this book. So like I don't really know how to talk about this aspect. It seems like a lot of readers um, really like the portrayal but I did see some who felt that it was like very hurtful and harmful. So just like keep that in mind. Um, again the author herself has like talked about her reasoning for the story so I'm not like questioning that. Um, I just like I feel like her intentions could have been shown in the book with a little more clarity and a little more nuance because I don't feel like we really got that. Um, and then I also had some other issues with the book as well. So this book was I think much too long. Um, again the writing itself wasn't a slog to get through but the book is very very long and fairly slow and I don't feel like the characters were well enough developed to make it like still engaging because I love a well done like slow paced character focused book. I love those. This didn't really work for me because I don't feel like the characters were done super well. They didn't have a lot of depth. Um, even Kakei, like there were parts of her that I liked but there were other parts of her that I didn't really like. Like one big issue I had is um, she ends up having this kind of like magical power in the book and I feel like the ethical implications of what she does are never discussed or referenced or dealt with at all, which is especially weird considering the way she feels about the way another character does a similar thing, which that other character is not justified at all. That's not what I'm saying. I just think it's very odd that Kakei has the almost exact same ability that she uses a lot throughout the book and that's never like commented on or discussed in any way, so I really didn't like that. Um, I also feel like the side characters were really flat and underdeveloped. Like there were some of them I liked initially, but a lot of them ended up being very inconsistent. Um, there were places where it felt like the author was setting us up for like kind of a, a twist on our expectations and then that didn't really happen either, so they just felt kind of inconsistent. I also feel like there were parts of the plot or characterization that felt like they were kind of trying to force us to feel a certain way. This is something I've talked about before where like there's some books where it feels like the author rather than writing something in a way that naturally creates a feeling just kind of tries to force feed you the way you're supposed to feel about something and there were a couple of things that this happened with in this book. Like for example how we were supposed to feel about some of the characters even before we had seen reasons for feeling that way or even plot stuff. Like for example one of Kakei's main frustrations throughout the book is that unlike other people um, the gods ignore her and that makes sense why she would be very upset and frustrated by that. But then we see evidence to the contrary that isn't really presented as like contradicting that. Um, so there were a few plot things like that that were kind of weird. I do want to finish with some things I did enjoy though. I really liked the character of Lakshmana. He was probably one of my favorites, if not my favorite. I also think Dashareth was really interesting and his character didn't go the way I expected, so I liked that. It's also cool that we have an asexual and I believe implied to be a romantic as well main character because um, Kakei is, so that was cool to see. And I also really loved the emphasis on social change and on Kakei using her power and her resources um, to help other people. Like the way that we see that she doesn't want to become complacent just because her fortunes have improved a lot. So there were things I liked about this. Again, people, like this has gotten almost universally glowing reviews. Um, I just had kind of mixed feelings about it and I haven't actually rated this one because again there are some parts that I feel pretty strongly about but I also don't feel like I'm the definitive voice on those, you know? So um, take that as you will. That's not a very helpful review, sorry. <laughs> Then the other arc that I read this month was The Ghosts of Rose Hill by R.M. Romero and this one comes out on May 3rd. I have been really excited for whatever R.M. Romero would write next ever since I read and loved The Dollmaker of Krakow and I'm so happy to say that I loved this one as well. So we're following our main character Alana and she is staying with, I think it's her aunt maybe, in Prague um, over the summer I believe and um, she's kind of using this as a chance to try and figure herself out and to try and win over um, her parents because she really wants to pursue music for a living and they want her to do something else um, and her, they kind of have an agreement where I think this summer she's gonna like work really hard, study really hard and I think um, like if she gets into certain programs then they're gonna like go along with her wanting to study music. I think that's kind of the setup. Um, and then while she is there she ends up becoming very involved in caring for and restoring um, a Jewish cemetery in the area like in Prague um, and while she is working there she ends up meeting a boy who is actually a ghost. His name is Benjamin and he died over a century ago and then Alana meets someone who it seems like is going to let her um, get to study music and to you know grant all of her wishes and everything um, but then it turns out that they are much more sinister than Alana initially thought um, so there is this this creeping danger as well that her and Benjamin and some other characters are trying to, to like fight back against and I really really loved this. Um, this is also a novel in verse and I think the writing was really wonderful. Um, it's like a very like quick and flowing kind of style but there were like even in the even in the the sections or the poems that were less um, 
like fancy almost um in every single poem like a section of the book um there were multiple like wham lines that just like stopped me in my tracks um this is a book i definitely know i'm gonna want to buy and annotate at some point because there's so many favorite lines i have here um well again the verse is still very accessible i think um i also liked alana as a main character i think unlike a lot of other novels and verse I've read, this one isn't so much an in-depth character study because Alana kind of is still figuring herself out and we see that throughout the book. Um, there's also a really big emphasis on the setting and on history. Um, I love the way that Prague was described. I think that setting was evoked so beautifully while not like taking over the story um, and I really love the sense of history and like this overlapping past and present. We also get a really strong focus on Alana's Jewish beliefs and practices and we see the way, like this is really celebrated in the book, and we see the way that those give her strength. Um, and I thought that was wonderful. I really liked the relationship between Alana and Benjamin. I really liked the way that music was used in this book. And I think that R.M. Romero did a really fantastic job of connecting the antagonists and obstacles of this book with like anti-Semitism and like with a wider like cultural history, like the parallels that this draws between what's happening now and what Ilana has grown up knowing that her people have faced. I think like, I just think that was done really masterfully. I also think the emphasis on cemeteries and on Ilana caring for those was done really well. Um, you can see in the author's note that that is based on R. Romero's own experiences and I just really really loved this book. I just thought it was beautifully done, um, really thoughtful, really like interesting and well told, really emotional. Um, I just really loved this and I give The Ghosts of Rose Hill five stars. Next I have A Kind of Spark by Elle McNichol. This is a contemporary book and I've heard amazing things about Elle McNichol before and after reading this I wholeheartedly agree I'm definitely going to be buying and reading her other books. We are following our main character Addie. Um, this book is set in Scotland. The author is also Scottish and um, she is autistic and she is learning in school about um, the witch trials that happened in Scotland a few centuries ago and in her town they actually burned several women to death who were accused of being witches and Addie is really upset by this. She doesn't understand why other people aren't and and she feels in a special connection to these women because they were targeted and killed for being different. And as an autistic person, Addie really like sees herself in these women um, and she's really upset at this injustice. So she starts pushing for her town to build a memorial um, to these to honor these women um, and to talk about what happened to them. And the town is very reluctant to go along with that. Um, and so we see her like fighting for that. We see her start to make friends with a new girl at school. Um, she does get bullied at school, but she does have some people around her who um, are there for her and who understand her. She also has an older sister named Kitty who is also autistic. And so we really see the support system that she has in place. And I, I just love this so, so much. Um, this is definitely gonna be like a new like recommendation I kind of have in my toolkit for people looking to get into middle grade or people trying to understand why middle grade is so important because I think this is a phenomenal book. Um, I talked to multiple people who had um, started reading this and they all said that like when they started it, it seemed written much more young than they were expecting than some other middle grade books are. But as soon as they got like into the story, they like stopped noticing that. So I think this is a good example of how like adults can enjoy books that are written for younger audiences. And I just love this so much. I loved Addie as a main character. She is so fierce and smart and compassionate and empathetic and I just adored her and I wanted good things for her and like I'm just so proud of her you know for like standing up for what is right. Um, I also think this book does a fantastic job of like talking about and pushing back against like stereotypes of autistic people because um, for example one of the really harmful common ones is that autistic people don't have emotions um, or that they are like that they don't have feelings the way that neurotypical people do and we see that that is absolutely not the case. Um, like Addie is actually so empathetic that like she doesn't understand why other people aren't really upset by this like she is and um, the book also like does a really great job of um, like kind of telling you or teaching you about Addie's experiences um, as an autistic kid and the obstacles she faces, the judgment she faces, um, but also the things that like make her who she is and make her special. Like she says that she doesn't want to change the way that she sees the world, you know, she doesn't want to not be autistic. She just wants people to treat her better, um, like the way that she deserves. And I just think this is such a valuable book for like people of any age to like read. By the way, I should have mentioned this at the beginning, but this is Own Voices. Elle McNichol is also autistic and I feel like you can really tell that. Like I'm not autistic myself, so keep that in mind, but I just feel like, like I've read some other books that have autistic characters in them, some of which feel very sympathetic, um, but I just, it feels different. Like you can, I feel like you can tell when you read this book that Elle McNichol is 
telling talking from a place of her own experience and I just think that is so important so valuable this is also a book I think is a great example of why people writing their own stories is so important like of course it's important to include autistic characters in media that is not just by autistic creators that's very important as well but I think this book is just such a phenomenal example of why it matters so much to to have and to promote and to share um stories that are written by people who know this very personally um i also really loved the friendships that she forms and there is like she has a really horrible teacher at this school um that's one of the main obstacles outside of Addie trying to get this mo uh, memorial built is her teacher is just atrocious um and so that is really hard to read in parts but i also think the book does a great job of especially because it is for younger readers balancing the reality of what Addie has to face from some people while also having people who are supportive of her you know who do love her and like her parents are really supportive um and we also see that the new friend Addie makes is very supportive as well and I think that was great because we see that this this kid is is you know a great friend to Addie but we also see that they make mistakes sometimes like she's never interacted with an autistic person before she's never been friends with one and so we see her like make mistakes but do better then um so i loved that as well i also really loved the way that um through the main plot of Addie trying to get this memorial built it really shows why it is so important to care about things that happened in the past because like one of the main arguments from people who don't think they need this monument is like well that happened so long ago like why should we like why should we be worried about it you know and Eddie says like of course it still matters because if we don't talk about these things then they're going to happen again like the fact that people can say why do you even care about this just proves that this kind of remembrance is necessary you know yeah i just adored this book i think the characterization was fantastic i think the plot was engaging i think that the perspective it gives is so so important i think this book does a fantastic job of being very informative and talking about Addie's experiences while also having this like really compelling story like this is one of the many books that um does both like you don't have to have a book that you learn something from or a book you enjoy like you can have both and it just makes me so happy to know that kids have this book that readers of all ages have this book um and i obviously gave a kind of spark five stars next i finished abounding might by melissa mcshane this is the third book in the extraordinary series um which is a series of companion novels that are an alternate history plus historical fantasy um it's set during the napoleonic wars um and in this world people have different abilities um and some of them it's very rare but some of them are extraordinaries in a certain ability um and each of our main characters are so our main character in this one is lady daphne st Clair, um and she's an extraordinary bounder it's kind of like teleporting basically um and she can take other people with her and she is um, working in the war office and then at the beginning like the very very beginning of the book um something happens where because Daphne um is really not good dealing with like blood or injury like she actually like passes out or blacks out at the sight of blood um something happens where somebody dies um who who wouldn't have if this hadn't happened and uh, Daphne is you know disgraced she feels like horrible about what happened and she is kind of punished by being demoted um she is just it's decided that now she's going to be like the personal transport basically um of this man in the army like his wife who like they live in colonial india this is when the british were occupying india um and daphne is basically their personal transport she just like takes them back and forth from england to india and daphne's obviously still really upset by what happened um by the fact that somebody died because of her and she's trying to come to terms with that um throughout the book and she ends up getting kind of wrapped up in some like political turmoil that is happening in india um her and this man named captain fletcher they end up working together to try and solve this mystery and to figure out what's going on um and yeah like i i liked this book overall i did have a couple of issues with it which i'll get to in a minute but um i do continue to enjoy the writing of this series and the setting and the magic um i find these powers so fascinating and i feel like melissa mcshane does a great job of in each book telling you like really focusing on the powers of the main character of the book and not like overloading you with a lot of other detail like you know enough enough to know how other powers work but like each book you get the most information about the power that the main character has which i think makes sense i also really loved daphne as a main character we met her in the second book and i loved her she's just so bright and bubbly and she's determined to make something of herself and to be useful and in this book we really see that after this horrible thing that happens um it does change the way she acts like it's she's not really herself um but that i think makes sense i think she's written very well like i think her shame and her grief at what happened is conveyed so well and you also 
it's like you understand why she feels responsible and why other people hold her responsible but you also like understand why it's like yes it, it happened because of her but she genuinely didn't know this would happen like she thought that um that she would be able to get past it and it's not like she just um like lost her head you know and wasn't able to do anything like she actually passed out i also really liked captain fletcher like i just really enjoyed his and daphne's interactions and relationship um i also think their like their powers played off of each other really interestingly especially in terms of their like growing interest in each other um because daphne is a bounder so in order to transport people she has to like pick them up she's been training to be super strong like for most of her life basically and it, that was another thing i loved is how physically strong she is and how like just it's just very satisfying to like watch her impress people who didn't think anything of her um so she has to like pick people up to transport them and fletcher is his ability um he's a discerner which means that he can like feel people's emotions when he touches them um and so you can see that that would make for some interesting tension and i just really liked their developing romance even though it kind of like they they start getting interested in each other much earlier than i usually like in books but i did have a couple of significant issues with this book even though i liked a lot of things about it and like really it could be summed up as i wish the book had gone farther with the commentary on colonialism um because like again this is set in india during the time when britain was occupying india and like the author has like a note where she explains why she changed some things or why she kept some things and i get that um but for example she doesn't change the name of the east india trading company which in this book is portrayed as much more benign than it was in real life and like I, I get why the author maybe did that but i think that maybe she should have like changed the name or changed other things so that it felt more distant from reality you know because it's hard not to think about the real east india company while you're reading this even though it is different um and this is alternate history like there are big events that haven't happened or that have happened differently so i think we could have changed that we could have even made this like a situation where maybe britain did not occupy india like you know maybe this was like a diplomatic mission gone wrong or like there are a lot of other ways i think that the same plot and conflict could have happened and just it would have gone farther in terms of like commenting on imperialism and colonialism and all of that um like i do like that daphne and fletcher are shown to be very much more sympathetic towards the indian like people um than most people around them and i think that the book did a pretty good job balancing them having believable views you know coming from the background they did while also being um very like very open to having their mind changed or being much more forward thinking than other people are so like there were ways it could have been done a lot better and i just wish it had been basically um like i'm not expecting our two main characters to single-handedly overthrow the british empire but i think that we could still have gone farther than we did um so that was kind of the big drawback for me with this one but i did still like it and i gave a bounding might 3.75 stars um i'm hopeful that in future books the commentary goes farther because i think that the other books i've read in the series so far do a pretty good job of talking about different issues so i'm hopeful that this was kind of a one-off Next, I finished The Frozen Crown by Greta Kelly. This is the first book in a fantasy duology, um, and we're following our main character, Askia, I think is her name? Yes. <laughs> um, and this is another book where I had very, like, distinct feelings about different parts of it, I think. Um, so our main character is Askia, and she is the, like, ruler. I think at this point, she's still considered a princess or a queen, I'm not sure. But her kingdom is in danger of being invaded by this empire that is conquering a lot of different kingdoms. Um, like, people are getting slaughtered, villages and towns are getting overrun, and it's really, really bad. Things are looking very bleak, and so Askia is trying to get political and military support from other kingdoms, um, and they're not really giving it to her, or they're, they're not giving it to her. And so she decides to go to the court of this other kingdom and to basically try and, like, schmooze them into giving her support that she very desperately needs. Um, and that's kind of where the rest of the book takes place, is her trying to fit in. Her country is much more uh, about like being in the wilds and being kind of like rugged and everything, um, whereas the court that she's in is much more like arts and, um, you know, beauty focused and that kind of thing. Um, so it's a big adjustment for her. She also is very frustrated by the lack of help that she's getting, by the fact that she has to be polite and make nice with people while she knows that people are dying. Um, and yeah, like I liked this. I was liking it more at the beginning though. Like the first third of this book, I really loved. Um, like I was really enjoying it. I was really engaged in the plot. Um, I really like Askia as a main character. She's really determined and 
I like that she is very aware of her own strengths and weaknesses. Like she's not afraid to use the fact that, for example, she's very attractive and like she can, um, she, maybe she's able to charm people into listening to her. Um, she takes advantage of the fact that she's underestimated, things like that, um, while she also recognizes that she's not the most diplomatic person. <laughs> uh, like this is a really difficult thing for her in a lot of ways because she's not used to this kind of political maneuvering. Um, and I just thought she was a very interesting character. I really felt for her. I felt like her her frustration was communicated really well because she's having to like dress up and go to parties and pretend that everything's okay when people are dying like her kingdom is being overrun and everybody else wants to pretend that it's not happening um so i really liked askia i liked the writing of this book i liked the political stuff that was happening um a couple of the side characters i really enjoyed but then like the rest of the book i was getting i just got less interested in um for one thing i <laughs> once again i think i picked the wrong love interest and then we find out some things where like maybe I was like oh, okay I guess maybe this person is not a good option but it didn't make me like the other person more like I didn't dislike him but it just is they're not tropes that I enjoy and I just I don't know I thought his connection with Askia was really overdone like it just it was very like you'd think they would have been in love with each other for ages you know the way that they were thinking about and talking about the other person um so that was frustrating there was also like a weird like romantic connection with another character where like I see why it happened for story reasons and I'm not saying it doesn't make sense but it's just odd <laughs> and I can't really say much more about it without giving stuff away but it was just weird. And then I also just found the plot of the rest of the book a lot less interesting to me. Um, like so Askia has magical abilities um, and the stuff that started happening with that I just didn't find as interesting as like the political stuff and like the character stuff and seeing if Askia was going to be able to win people over and I also had some things I didn't love about the ending so this ended up being 3.5 stars for me I still liked it and it is one that I think is underhyped I haven't heard a lot about it and I did enjoy it um but it just could have been better for me than it was then I finished Not Here to Be Light by Michelle Kwok this is one of the most underrated contemporaries I think I've read recently um because I loved this I'm getting ahead of myself but guys I loved this book so much so we're following I mean character Eliza um, and at the beginning of the book, she is getting ready for her school newspapers, like um, staff elections. I think she's running to be editor in chief. Um, and it's like a very prestigious newspaper. Like her, her school's newspaper is like very well thought of, again, very prestigious. And Eliza has, like, she knows that she's qualified. Um, she's basically running unopposed. She's put in so much work to this paper. She's so good at what she does. She thinks it's going to be an easy win. Um, she justifiably thinks it's going to be an easy win. And then at the last second, um, this ex jock, named Len, um, he decides that he's gonna run too. And even though he has very little experience, he doesn't even seem to care about being here, and there's really no reason that he would be qualified, um, Len wins. And the reasons that people give are that he just seems like more of a leader, um, and other kind of coded statements that make Eliza realize that he won because he's a boy, um, and because she is too assertive or abrasive. And she is understandably very upset by this and very angry. And so she writes this kind of personal essay um, about what happened and exposing the fact that sexism is alive and well in their school um, and even in places that are supposed to be a meritocracy like the newspaper. And she doesn't print it or post it or anything, but somebody else finds it and posts it on their online newspaper. And it kind of goes viral. Um, Eliza ends up unintentionally finding herself at the head of this feminist movement in her school. So she's dealing with that. Um, and then she also, her and Len end up getting paired to have to work on certain newspaper stories together and as time goes on she starts liking him more and maybe even having a crush on him and she's very upset by the fact that this is happening um as the summary for the book describes it that she's like basically falling for like the face of the patriarchy um and that's kind of like the setup for the book and like I said, I absolutely loved this. Um, this is one of my most anticipated releases that I talked about last year and I finally read it and I loved it so much. I mentioned when I talked about it before that like the only thing I was a little concerned about was how the feminist emphasis was going to play against the romance angle because again the romance is with the person who takes the job that Eliza deserves, you know? So I was nervous about that but I think it was done so so well. Um, like I loved this book. I loved Eliza as a main character. I think it's funny because the back of the book even jokingly warns you um, that it contains an unlikable female character and I think that's interesting because I think there's like two kinds of characters people describe as unlikable. One of them is like just genuinely unpleasant people who I tend to agree those are unlikable characters. I don't enjoy following them. But then the other kind of character 
um, gets applied to women a lot, not exclusively, but a lot of the time, and they're characters who are assertive and who speak up for what's important and who are more concerned with doing the right thing than in placating people. And that's what Eliza was to me. Like, she wasn't cruel to people. She wasn't rude for no reason. She just was very unapologetic about who she is and what she wants and what she deserves. And I loved that about her. Um, I, I just love the messages of this book. I love the way it, it talks about um, feminism and the ways that we can feel like a bad feminist and how being a feminist doesn't mean that you don't want to date somebody and things like that. Um, I also loved Eliza's realization throughout the book that she maybe has been judging other girls as well um, because one of the girls who gets really involved with Eliza's like feminist movement um, is kind of the preppy popular girl. Um, her name is Serena. I loved her character. I loved the way her and Eliza got to know each other and the way that Eliza was forced to reckon with the way that she judges other girls as well. Like you guys know that's a subplot like that I love in books. We see Eliza realize that um, even though she has taken pride for so long in being the smart one and in being like um, like too serious about herself and respects herself too much to care about things like clothes and, and stuff like that, we see her realize that you can be a feminist, you can be smart, and still enjoy those things. I also like that this book was intersectional. Eliza is Asian and we see like the the model minority myth gets talked about a lot. And Eliza's best friend Winona, um, we see we see them talk about the fact that like Winona could do the same things that Eliza and Serena do, but because she's a black girl, that will be taken very differently than when they do them. So the angry black girl stereotype was like discussed in this book and I really liked that as well. Um, and like I said, I also liked the way the romance was done. I think it was handled really well. Like as we got to know Len more, I actually really liked him as a character. I do think that he should have backed um, Eliza up for things sooner, but I actually did really like him. I think the book did a great job of like showing why things happened the way they did and not letting him off the hook but also explaining like why things happened. Um, I don't really know how to explain it but I ended up really liking him and I feel like that romance angle did not at all detract from the message and, and then like the themes of the book. Also just like a couple of personal bonus points from me, um, there is like a, a very small subplot involving like a Shakespeare scene that they're working on for a class project so that was fun and also this book does something that I love and that made me so happy which is that it talks about the actual origins of the well-behaved women never make history quotation like it actually talks about the context for that and it's that that's like something that I just really love because that's a quote that is basically only used in the exact opposite context of what it was intended um so I loved the way that that was talked about in this book and the way that played into the themes of the story I also want to mention that I feel like YA contemporaries can get kind of a bad rap from different kinds of readers and there are a lot of like more thoughtful and um, meaningful reasons I could give for why I think they there are some there are some really amazing books that are YA contemporaries but one of the kind of sillier reasons is there is no other age and genre combination where you can have a romance where characters are forced to work on a project together because I love that and I know that you can have kind of a similar thing with like a college setting or like at a workplace or something but it just doesn't hit the same you know but anyway I just really really loved this book um again I think it's one of the most underhyped contemporaries uh, that I've read recently just like books in general I've heard like nobody talk about this really like obviously some people have read it but I haven't seen it getting a lot of attention and I think that's a shame because I think it did everything really, really well. And I gave Not Here To Be Liked five stars. Next, I am so proud of myself because I finally read another book by somebody who I consider a favorite author. Um, that is A Field Guide to Getting Lost by Joe McCullough. Joe McCullough wrote Bloodwater Paint, which is one of my favorite novels. Um, and I finally have read another book by her, so go me. Um, and I actually listened to this on audio. The narrator was Tara Sands, and I think she did a pretty good job. There were a couple of accents that I think she maybe did a, like overdid a little bit um, but as a narrator I thought she was pretty good um, and we are following uh, two different perspectives um, the kids who are on the cover here let me check their names we're following Sutton and Louise and their parents have started dating they're actually getting very serious about each other and that's kind of hard on both of them and so their parents are kind of trying to force them together and to like hope that they'll get along better and become friends because again they're the parents relationship is looking much more serious one of the reasons they put off reading this book is because I thought that it involved camping for some reason um, it kind of looks like it involves camping right and I just am not into camping at all <laughs> like so I put it off even though I have really enjoyed the author and I thought I would like the book but it actually does not involve camping um, one of the expeditions that they go on on as like a, a family kind of um, is like this hike or this trail and at one point Sutton and Louise actually get lost and so we see them have to work together to try and you know get back to their families and everything um, and I ended up really liking this actually like much more than I thought. I really loved the developing friendship between Sutton and Louise. Um, I think that it's very understandable why they wouldn't get on right away um, like not just because of their different interests like Sutton is all about like robots and programming and the sciences and Louise wants to be an author um, like he loves fantasy novels and he's writing one himself and all of that and they just have very different interests and um, personalities 
And also there's the fact that they both are having a hard time admitting that their parent wants to get, like marry somebody else or, you know, be serious about somebody else. Um, and I thought that was done really well also. I especially really loved Luis. Like, I just... He's such a sweet boy and I just wanted good things for him. Um, Sutton took me a little longer to warm up to because it just felt like we didn't get as much nuance with her as we did with Louise, but that changed as the book went on. I ended up really enjoying both of them as characters. Um, I also think the book did a great job of getting me to actually buy into and care about the parents' relationship um, because as I have said, I am basically Marianne Dashwood in the sense that I don't really care about second attachments. <laughs> uh, like I don't find that interesting or engaging in storytelling and this book actually won me over with that so that's impressive um and i think it did the really complex family dynamics of this book beautifully like that's one of the things i think was done best in this book um is how complicated and messy the like families can be um and yeah just like the way that sutton um relates to her mother who is like studying i think penguins and how Sutton like understands that it's important that her mother do this work but also she kind of feels like her mother is choosing them over her um and then Luis his father actually died um a while ago and like seeing the way that um he still misses him and like the the way him and his mom are dealing with that still I did have a couple of issues though like one thing is I feel like Sutton in some ways could be read as an autistic character and I just wish the author had come out and said that like I don't know if that was the intention, but um, I just wish authors would be more clear about that so that we know we're getting that representation. I do also want to mention um, that I saw reviews saying that Luis's portrayal as a kid who has a really severe allergy um, is not very accurate. So do keep that in mind, especially if you're reading this with kids um, or if you are, I don't know, like reading it with somebody who does have that experience. Like apparently it's really not realistic. Um, so I just want to mention that. But overall, I enjoyed this and I gave A Field Guide to Getting Lost four stars. Next, I finished Jefferson's Sons by Kimberly Brubaker Bradley. Um, I was very grateful my library had this book because this book is out of print and almost impossible to find, definitely impossible to find for a reasonable price. Um, and this is about several of the children of Thomas Jefferson that he had with his slave Sally Hemings, um, which, you know, by definition is non-consensual. And we are following a few different um, points of view. And I actually, like, I really liked how that was done because um, each, there's like three kind of sections of the book. Two of them are from um, Jefferson's, two of Jefferson's sons. And then one of them is the son of a family who is very close to the Hemings family. Um, and it was interesting because as I finished each section, I was like, wait, I don't want to move to another character. But then that new character won me over as well. Um, and this is just like a really fantastic book. It's obviously very difficult to read, but I think it is so important. Um, like the way it talks about what what these kids lives were like and how like yes in some ways they had like special privileges because it was like an open secret that they were the children of Thomas Jefferson. Um, so in some ways they got special treatment but like it it still was not okay, you know? Um, I just think this talks about so many different aspects of this time period and of what people went through, like the family separation and um, the the idea of like passing. Like there are characters who um, know that if they try and live their life um, passing as white in order to get like even the most basic, you know, considerations, they'll have to cut themselves off from their family basically because their family do not pass. I thought the writing itself was fantastic. Um, I think the characterization was brilliant. I think that the story is just so important and so well told, like the way that it talks about all of these different um, issues and aspects of slavery. Like at one point, um, the characters are trying to plan for if they get sold, um, they like have have talked to owners who are known for being like kinder to their slaves and so they're going to make sure that those people buy them instead of someone else and like somebody says like oh he's a good man he'll take care of us and one of the other characters makes the point that you cannot be a good person and say you own another person and i think that is something that believe it or not we need reminders about because i think there's this narrative sometimes that like well some of the slave owners were really bad and abusive but some of them were not that bad and it's like okay good that you're not beating people to death but also owning other humans' property is kind of a deal breaker. Um, like, I, I just think stuff like that that this book talks about was done really well, was really important. Like the scenes that it shows at like auctions and everything. Like, I just think in general, it did such a good job of showing how none of these experiences were okay. Like none of these experiences should have happened. Like even though some of these kids had, you know, privileges, relatively speaking, it was not okay. And even though Thomas Jefferson did important things for the US, that does not make him a good person. That does not mean we have to pretend that he was better than he was, that he didn't own slaves, that he didn't have children with his slaves. Like, um, yeah, like, I, I just think this book did so many things so well. I think it's really, really important. Um, 
I read it in basically one night like it's just so gripping like you care about these characters so much and like what they are going through and um, this is historical fiction so there are parts that the author talks about in the author's note that she had to kind of imagine or extrapolate but it is very like historically based there's a lot of this that like we know happened sorry I'm feeling like I'm not doing a great job of describing this book or like why it is so effective and well done but I really really highly recommend it if you can get your hands on a copy. Um, I know that again it's out of print but a lot of libraries do tend to have it so if that's an option for you I would definitely recommend it and I gave Jefferson Sons five stars. Next I finished Ship of Magic by Robin Hobb. This is the first book in the Live Ship Traders trilogy um, and we actually have a live show for this. I am a guest on um, the read-along that Beautifully Booked Bethany is doing. I will link that live show down below. So it's a completely different setting, different cast from the Farseer trilogy um, and we're following like a lot of different main characters and this is set in Bingtown which is a setting we knew a little bit about in the other series um, and kind of one of the main events that starts off the book is one of our main characters is Elthea um, and her father dies and this in this setting there are these things called live ships um, which are specially carved ships that after three successive generations of a family have died on board um, the ship quickens like it comes alive um, and that is happening at the beginning of the book and Althea expects that she's going to inherit this ship that's what everyone is expecting and then that's not what happens. I feel like there's like too much set up to like try and explain it all so I'm just gonna stop there. Um, I had mixed feelings about this book. If you guys saw my last wrap up <laughs> I definitely liked this book more than the end of the Farseer trilogy so that's a plus um, and I, I think I, I like the writing. I think Robin Hobb is like she's obviously a good writer um, in terms of like sentence construction and everything. Um, she does still have an overwriting problem in terms of, not in terms of over description but in terms of how absurdly long her books are. Um, like this book does not need to be 880 pages. I Very few books do but I think this one is not one of them. Um, yeah it just it really it was hard to stay invested in this and before I get into too many more thoughts I should like preface this. I have a new strategy for reading Robin Hobb books because after I finished the Farseer trilogy I'm like I can't I can't do that again. I'm not going to put myself through that every time I finish a book from her or a series from her. Um, so I have kind of a new approach. One is I am just not going to care about anyone that is in this book or anything that happens. Um, like I just I'm not going to get attached to characters anymore because I refuse to do that again. Um, and then the other thing is there are a couple of things I have kind of like judiciously spoiled myself for. Um, just like certain things like so that I know which character relationships to actually get invested in and which ones I shouldn't bother with. Um, and just to, I don't know, like head off any <laughs> potential concerns because I could see I could see people being like well then how do you expect to enjoy those books if you're not like reading them like you normally do because I am somebody who really cares about characters and emotional investment. So um, the reasoning for this <laughs> is if you guys saw my review of the last book that I read from her um, I think it'll be pretty clear that changing my strategy can only help. <laughs> like that could only give me more positive feelings about these books. Um, so that's kind of the, the thinking I have here. Um, yeah like I, I kind of hate that I have to read these books that way but I need to do it for my own like peace of mind really. Um, I know there are people who think that that a level of anger automatically makes somebody a good author. I do not think that. Um, Anyway, so I liked some of the characters and plot lines. Um, I will say that even though I hate books that take place on ships, um, this one did not bore me like that. So that was a plus. Um, there are some characters I liked more than others, but the problem is that there are very, very few characters where I both like them as a character and I care about their storyline. So like Althea was fine. I did not like his storyline though. I found it so boring. Um, and then like Wintro, I liked him as a character did not like his storyline. Kyle is absolute scum of the earth and I hate Kenneth. Like we did not need that many Kenneth chapters. Like I yeah. So it just I just think it's a very bold choice to make like so many of your perspectives like of your perspective characters um just be like so reprehensible because like I, I get that they're antagonists and we were supposed to dislike them but at a certain point it's like you're just making me not want to read this book. <laughs> Uh, like when I actually did read it, it read much quicker than I expected so that was nice but like in terms of enjoyment or like actually like wanting to pick this book up a lot of times I didn't. Um, like pretty much the only character who I liked and I found the story interesting was Paragon um, but I'm not gonna get attached to him because I'm sure something terrible will happen. Um, yeah and then I also really really hate that every single female character in this book the obstacle she is facing is 
misogyny. Um, and this wouldn't have bothered me except that I had not been led to expect that. Like all of the reviews I've heard from people about this series led me to believe that there, like that this was going to be different. Um, like I was not going into this prepared for an yet another fantasy world where it sucks to be a woman all the time. Um, especially because at the beginning of this book we're told how Bingtown is actually much more progressive about that. Like they have this long history of admiring and supporting strong women and I was like, thank god I love this, especially after the Farseer trilogy. And then it's like, oh just kidding! <laughs> actually Bingtown is getting worse now and now misogyny is like a huge problem here too. Um, and it, it just, it bothered me that like every single female character, like that was their main obstacle. And I understand why, like I... <laughs> I know that's something that happens in a lot of fantasy and I don't always complain about that in fantasy. I think that's an obstacle that can be handled in a way that is done really well, but I just wasn't expecting it here and so it felt very annoying. It felt like like Robin Hobb promised me something she didn't deliver. Um, or, or like other reviewers too promised me something that wasn't delivered here. And it's not just that, I just feel like the general perspective handling of the female characters is not something I'm enjoying. Um, so for example, Malta is very frustrating. She does everything in the worst possible way. Um, but I can see that we're setting up for a certain kind of character arc with her. But like the thing that really bothered me about the way that she was treated and viewed in the book is that like her dream, the thing that she wants, um, is basically like to find love and romance and to not just have babies until she dies. Um, and I feel like that's a reasonable ask and that is like I'm just really hoping that the way that her plot resolves is not like um, it's like, well, see, this is the problem is that she wanted this and she shouldn't have because there is there's also just like a real focus on like breeding. So I, I don't like that. Um, and that's also like a personal preference thing. I know that annoys me more than it does other readers. So keep that in mind. But um, yeah, I just I don't know. Like I just maybe this is closer to a three stars than three and a half. Like I like some things about it, but it was also a very frustrating experience. And I just like I'm not seeing what other people see with Robin Hobb yet. Um, like I think there's a lot of other fantasy authors who write better, um, who write better characters. Like I, I do like her setting and her world and I like some of her ideas. I even like some of her character types or characters that she writes, but I think I just hate what she does with them and I don't like the way that she, I don't know, like the decisions she makes. Um, again, I think this book is so overwritten for what it is. I, I don't know. Next I finished Darling by Kay Ingram and this is another book that I um, partly listened to an audiobook and then I switched to the physical, which not because I wasn't liking the audio. I actually loved the narrator. Um, I'll put her name on the screen because I, I don't remember it right now. Um, but she did a fantastic job. I just was like really enjoying this and I wanted to read it myself because <laughs> um, that sometimes happens with audiobooks for me. So this is kind of a contemporary thriller retelling of Peter Pan. Um, and first thing I'll say is that I think this is another retelling, like Sisters of the Never See actually, where whatever your feelings on the original, I think you could really enjoy this one. So we're following our main character Wendy and her and her family have just moved to Chicago and then one day a strange boy named Peter and a girl named Tinkerbell show up at her window and she ends up going off on, um, kind of a, against her better judgment, <laughs> um, she ends up getting caught up in their adventure. And I enjoyed this so much more than I was thinking. Like I've had a good time feeling about Kay Ingram for a while. I've wanted to try her books because I just felt like I would enjoy them. Um, and the premise for this one interested me. But I also, from things I had heard, I thought maybe it was going to do some things that I don't tend to like in Peter Pan retellings. But I think because I knew to expect certain things, it set me up to enjoy them and to take this book on its own terms. Because um, I thought it was done so well. Like, I I really like Kay Ingram's writing, first off. Um, I just think she writes very well. This was a very engaging book. It was very quick to read. Um, I really liked Wendy as a main character. And I really liked a lot of the supporting characters as well. Um, if you guys like the found family trope, I think this is a great recommendation for that. Um, and even some of the characters where like we met them and I didn't particularly like them or have like particular feelings about them, like Tinkerbell for example. Um, I didn't love her when we first met her, but by the end I really really did. Um, also one of my favorite side characters is this boy named Fjolder. I love him so much. Um, I also think it was very cool that um, he's asexual and he is like the romantic and charming one. I feel like that's not super common in terms of representation. Um, and this book just was also very diverse and the way that was I think included was um, it felt very effortless and I really appreciated that. I also thought the mystery thriller aspects were really gripping and really well done and I really love 
Like, I think Kay and Chrome did a fantastic job of deciding when to reveal information. Um, it was, like, the perfect moment. Like, just as I was starting to catch on to some things, she would, like, explain part of what was going on, and it was, like, the perfect balance of things I had kind of started to figure out, and then, like, things that surprised me. Um, I just thought that was brilliant. I really enjoyed this, and I gave Darling four stars. Next, I finished The Scandalous Sisterhood of Prick Willow Place by Julie Berry. Um, this is a mystery novel that is set in, I don't know, what year it was, but you can kind of see from the cover, it's like from um, like at least a, a hundred or so years ago. Um, and this is a really interesting book that I'm honestly surprised worked for me as well as it did because um, there's a lot of things about it that I normally am not a fan of. Um, so like I said, this is a mystery and it's kind of a, it's kind of one of those like madcap like shenanigans type mysteries because um we're following a bunch of different girls who all go to St. Ethelreda's school for young ladies and then one night at Sunday dinner their headmistress and her brother drop dead at the dinner table and the girls don't really know what to do um they also are really really close like they're really good friends and none of them really have anything at home that they want to go back to they all have reasons for wanting to stay at this school um but they know that they're not going to be allowed to do that if they find out that they don't have any people taking care of them there um so they decide to cover it up and to pretend that um, their headmistress and her brother have not died, um, and also to try and solve who did this. So like the things that normally wouldn't appeal to me. The tone of this book, like murder mysteries that have that kind of silly or comedic tone really don't work for me usually, but I liked this one. Um, also the fact that the cast of main girls are all kind of, I don't want to say flat characters exactly, but like they're all nicknamed based on like one defining personality trait and that's really like emphasized. Um, so for example, you have, let's see, they have like a cute little introduction thing at the beginning that I really enjoyed. Um, but you have disgraceful Mary Jane, um, who is always like flirting with men and everything and that's why she gets sent to the school. Um, you have smooth Kitty Heaton, who's like really good at talking herself out of situations. Um, you have pocked Louise Dudley, who um, has like face scars and she's like the one who's really interested in medicine and things like that. Um, so like they all have these very defining personality traits, but I just found that really charming and fun. Um, I think partly because I just really loved the writing of this book. Like I think Julie Berry is just a really good writer. Um, and I also just really liked the girls themselves and I loved their friendship. I loved the focus on friendships between girls. Um, I love the way that they're all like supportive of each other. And I also just really liked them in themselves, like as characters. Um, there were a few in particular that were my favorite. Like I really liked actually Mary Jane or Disgraceful Mary Jane. Um, and then Stout Alice, I really liked Smooth Kitty. I do want to mention that the book refers to them by their nicknames almost exclusively and normally that would annoy me but I think it didn't because I knew what to expect from this book like you know kind of the tone you know what you're getting and I just had a really good time with it um there were even some like little romantic subplots that I really liked that I thought were good I liked the humor um you do have to kind of suspend your disbelief a little bit with this one but if you know going in what you're gonna get I think you might have a good time with it at least I did um the only things I didn't really love is uh, some parts of the solution I didn't really like. Um, and then I also had some issues with the way a couple of the girls were treated. Um, like for example, um, Alice is one of my favorite characters, like stout Alice. And even though the the treatment of her was not as bad as I was afraid of, um, I still wish that that had been a little different, like the way they talk about, um, like the way that she talks about her body and things like that. And then also um, Martha or dull Martha. Um, I didn't like that sometimes it seemed like the, even her friends kind of viewed her as like, boring and a little dumb but we love her you know but overall i had a really good time with this and i gave the scandalous sisterhood of prick willow place four stars also because i don't think this should be considered a spoiler the puppy makes it out okay so that made me really happy next i finished rose by holly webb um this is a the first book in a middle grade fantasy series we're following our main character rose um at an orphanage and this is a historical fantasy and all the girls at this orphanage um they're taken care of until they can get old enough to be like placed into service so like they the, they become maids or something in these wealthier houses um and that happens to rose at the beginning of the book and she's really excited she's been wanting to do this for a while she wants to be able to like make money and you know earn her own living and to like um you know get out of this orphanage and so she ends of getting placed at the house of what was his name mr fountain um who is like the kind of court magician um and rose and like the other servants they don't do any of the magical stuff a lot of them don't trust the magical stuff but rose is starting to think that maybe she has some magical affinity as well which actually she really doesn't want she just wants to like keep her head down make some friends with the servants you know make her own good life 
and not have to worry about the magic and everything. Um, but of course it's not that simple and there are some children in the city who actually start going missing um, and Rose gets involved in trying to figure out what happened to them and to find them. Um, and I really like this. I am happy to start another Hollyweb series that I'm enjoying so far. Um, and I just, I really liked Rose as a character. She's very like determined and plucky and just like very practical. Like I love that about her. Um, I also think this book did a pretty good job of explaining why she wouldn't necessarily want magical abilities when she thinks she's getting them. I liked some of the supporting characters. Like I actually ended up liking Freddy a lot more than I thought at the beginning. Like I was not a fan of his at first, but he grew on me. Um, there's a talking cat named Gus and I loved him. Um, I just really like Holly Webb's writing. I think her writing is very like effortless. Like she's just really good at like characterization and like setting and everything. And um, there's also some humor in here as well. Um, and I thought the story was interesting. I also thought the magic was interesting and like the different um, perspectives on it. And um, yeah, like I just really enjoyed this. I gave Rose four stars. And finally, the last book I'm going to talk about in this first part of the wrap up is 13th Child by Patricia C. Reedy. Um, this is kind of an alternate historical fantasy. We're following our main character F and she is the 13th child in her family, which means she's believed to be very unlucky. Um, there are some people who treat her really horribly because of this. And her twin brother Lan um, is the seventh son of a seventh son, which means that people expect really good things from him and that he's going to be super talented and like a hero and all of this. Um, and near the beginning of the book, F's family ends up moving to um, like a like a magical college or university for her father to take a position there. Um, and we just see F, like in a way this is kind of slice of life, we see F adjusting to this magical school. We also see the effect that people's um, treatment of her has because like her, even her own family, some of her own family, like her cousins and aunts and uncles are really horrible to her about being a 13th child and um, so we see her dealing with that prejudice. Um, we see her starting to slowly make some friends and maybe fit in at this magical school even though she's still afraid people will find out um, in her new home that she's a 13th child. We see her learning more about magic. So this was a really interesting book. Um, I did really like F as a main character and I really felt for her. I also really like the writing. I always enjoy Patricia C. Reedy's writing and this no exception. I think she just balances like setting and characters and plot and everything really effortlessly. There were also some side characters I really loved like I think what's his name? William um, who is another character where at first I did not like him but by the end of the book he was one of my favorites. Um, I also really like Miss Ochiba who is a teacher that F um, ends up working with and like I just really really loved her. Like I loved how no nonsense she was, how smart she was, how much she cared for her students but also cared enough about them to make them give her her best work. Like I just really liked her. I really liked F's family, um, like her immediate family especially and like especially her parents. Like I just really loved them and how like I think in a lot of books like this you know they would have been some of the antagonists but they weren't. They really loved and supported F and they stood up for her and they wouldn't let people treat her badly and things like that. So I liked that. Um, and I also thought like the setting and the genre blend of this was really interesting because um, like I said it's like an alternate historical fantasy. It's kind of like pioneer era flavored. Um, but that also brings me to my big problem with this book which is the complete erasure of Native American peoples. Um, yeah like I that really really bothered me. It was weird because as the book went on I kept expecting to hear about like the the history of like the Native Americans or like whatever they would be known as in this world. Um, like I kept expecting to hear about them and like we never did. So there just are no indigenous people of North America in this world and that I just think is really uncomfortable. Like not a good choice uh, to put it mildly. Like I think maybe the author didn't want to have to deal with some of these like really horrible things that we've done to Native people like that history but also in some ways she still did because Miss Ochiba for example is a black woman and there was still a civil war that was fought over slavery. So like there there is some of our real world like negative history that is used here but not all of it. So like the omission, like the deliberate erasure of Native American peoples felt really glaring. Like if the book had been only slightly inspired by like the the frontier era, the pioneer era, I think that that would have worked better maybe. But if you're going to have it similar enough to our world that we have, for example, a civil war fought over slavery. I think it's reasonable to expect you to also talk about the native populations of this world because like in this version of the world there just weren't people already living there when the settlers got here. Um, 
which I think is just really uncomfortable because it, it makes literal a problem that already happens, which is the erasure of Native American peoples, of Indigenous peoples in general, and it just really, really bothered me. So even though I really liked pretty much everything else about this book, I could only really give it like a three or three and a half stars at the most because like, even though I don't think the author's intentions were bad, I think this is an example of how, you know, intentions do not equal impact. Um, and I just think there were ways that she could have gone about this that were done a lot better. Like, you don't have to make your whole story about racism, but if you're going to refer to it in some context and then completely erase it in another, I think that's not a great choice. So yeah, so this book ended up being a really mixed bag in that way. Um, so those are all of the books that I read in the first part of March. Um, this is a very long wrap up, I'm sorry, I already know that, but I just feel like doing three different parts again. I'm sorry. Um, please comment down below and let me know if you have read any of these books, what you thought of them, or if you're going to pick them up. Thank you guys so much for watching, I will see you soon with another video, and I hope you love the next book you read. Bye!